Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of the Urban Tumbleweed Podcast. I'm your host, Emily, and today we have a truly inspiring guest with us. Joining us on our journey today is a visionary leader and the driving force behind one of the most influential organizations in the sustainability space. I am thrilled to introduce our guest for today, Mel Clark, the CEO of Clean Tech Alliance. Together, we'll be diving into the depths of what it takes to create a quote-unquote green new world. Mel Clark is an incredibly eloquent advocate for transformative change in our approach towards a sustainable future, and I am so stoked for you all to hear what she has to say. We were first introduced at a panel during the PNW Climate Week last year, where I got to hear her talk for the first time, and I was truly, genuinely just blown away by her depth of knowledge. So... Whether you're a seasoned environmentalist or just starting to dip your toes into the world of sustainability, this episode is definitely bound to spark your curiosity and leave you feeling inspired to contribute to the creation of a greener, more sustainable world. So stay tuned and let's make the world a better place, one podcast episode at a time. So Mel, thank you so much for joining me today. Again, I super appreciate all of your time. I know that you're very busy and I would love for you to just give a quick overview of who you are. How did you get into Clean Tech Alliance and what Clean Tech Alliance really is? So hi, my name is Mel Clark. I am the CEO for the Clean Tech Alliance and the Clean Tech Alliance is an industry trade association focused on helping advance the deployment of clean technology. On any given day or week, I work with everything from cow poop to fusion energy. Uh, So how do you get involved with something that big and that broad? And quite honestly, that was never the original intent in my career. Uh, Before I had my kids, I was in uh, finance and real estate, uh, human resources, general business, uh, lots of just good basic jobs and climbing the corporate career ladder uh, and took a a pause after I had my kids and started working very part-time at a nonprofit, discovered I loved work that had more impact and more meaning and spent the next 20 years building up a nonprofit career. Went from uh, running a program to directing programs to directing a very small nonprofit uh, in the environmental space to uh, then becoming the executive director for a larger Seattle-based nonprofit. uh, And then finally just leveraging all that experience uh, when this opportunity drifted across my inbox to become the CEO for the Clean Tech Alliance. I couldn't not apply because the opportunity to work on a problem set that will affect pretty much every human that will ever walk on the planet again was one that I couldn't leave there. I had to put my name in the hat and and give that a shot. But really the way that uh, I I leveraged into that job was just having become very experienced in the daily grind ins and outs for a similarly sized organization. So when the opportunity came up, the experience was a fit. Absolutely. And What was your previous knowledge of sustainability issues that you're now tackling in this role? Did you have really any idea of the scope at which you were going to be working at with clean tech or sustainability? Or was this something that you came into, you had confidence because of your past experience and you just kind of took them head on and learned as you went? It would definitely be the second one. Uh, the The knowledge base I would have had, particularly on clean tech and sustainability, would have been what was on my nightstand for reading just from my own education. Books by climatological paleontologists are really wonderful. Plus, that's fun to say. So uh, it was certainly leveraging the experience of the knowledge of running a nonprofit versus the knowledge of what that nonprofit specific mission is. And so a demonstrable and genuine passion for the mission, but not a deep technical knowledge within it. So I was definitely on a very large learning curve the first 18 months to two years. And quite honestly, every day, this job gives me the opportunity to talk to a scientist, engineer, entrepreneur, and just look at her and say, oh, my gosh, you're working on what? That's amazing. (laughs) Absolutely. I feel like that is also so inspiring to know that you don't necessarily have to have a very deep wealth or technical knowledge of problems that you're addressing as long as you do have an interest in it and then you have skills to back up the mission that you are pursuing. So. I feel like a lot of people don't have the opportunity to really dive deep 
into sustainability as much as they might want to because there aren't a ton of resources outside of self-teaching. Um, like for myself, I have my master's in it, but that was also, there's a financial burden there, there's a time burden there, and not many people have the opportunity. So it's exciting and encouraging to hear that people can get into the sustainability space without necessarily having to have had a large a large history with sustainability. And I like to call them green collar jobs because <laughs> clean technology, clean energy, and sustainability fields are going to need people that know how to do just about everything. We're going to need a lot more mechanics and HVAC technicians and electricians that are trained on more advanced clean technology. Those jobs need to be upskilled with some high tech, but they'll still be, you know, real life jobs. And we're going to need accountants. We're going to need bookkeepers. We're going to need office managers. The The industry needs all of those jobs that are out there for a skill set you can leverage very, very well. Executive assistants, uh, attorneys, master's degrees, PhDs. So there's a lot of different educational on-ramps. And so one thing to think about um, from the Clean Tech Alliance's point of view is that we have to figure out how to ease and reduce barriers. For the size workforce that the clean energy needs are demanding, we have to be able to find different on-ramps and pathways to get more people trained for, prepared for, uh, be that degrees, certificates around the job training and ready for those jobs. But for a later or mid-career professional making a transition, as I've done two or three times now, <laughs> it is understanding the skill you're good at that you can deliver that cross applies. Mm -hmm. And when I interview junior candidates, I do see them say, oh, well, I've never really done business communications. Mm -hmm. But they've sent emails for a sports team to the parents and reserve the facilities. And they've done all these things to put on a, a soccer tournament, mm -hmm. but they don't think they have business communications because that was for sport. Right. But it's the identical skill set. So it's learning how to market your own skills, be that from a past job or a volunteer experience mm -hmm. into how does this deliver business value and meet the need? Absolutely. And that actually leads me into my next question, which is what do you see as the most significant challenge or challenges in the sustainability industry today? And how is Clean Tech Alliance addressing them, whether that be the workforce space, whether that be the actual technical, the technical issues of anthropological climate change? What, what are the major ones that you're addressing? That is not a simple or easy question. <laughs> yeah. We could do, you know, a year long podcast series starting to answer it. Um, clean technology has a, a life cycle development that is fondly referred to as the valley of death. So you get this wonderful idea and you begin to work on it with a student team or in a lab or at home in your garage. And in Seattle, where we're used to software companies, you bang out some beta code, you ship a prototype in six months, you have an exit, you get acquired, everyone's happy. Mm -hmm. Now we have another tech millionaire. Yay. In clean technology, that development life cycle can be 10 to 15 years. Right. So the biggest problem facing the industry is we don't have 10 to 15 years to invent new things and get them scaled and deployed. Mm -hmm. So we have to speed up the process for every one of those roadblocks at the way, innovation, ideation, uh, testing your, your facility, prototyping, uh, then, then the funding challenges come in. Can you get your seed round? Can you get your Series A? We see one of the biggest challenges right now is companies trying to get the Series B. And that mm -hmm. is not just a clean tech problem, but there's a dearth of Series B funding. You might get your Series C, but to get it, you might have to give exclusivity to one company, and now you're limiting your market. We don't have time to limit markets. Mm -hmm. Then we start to get into building and deploying at scale. Now you need a factory to produce those widgets. Well, it has to have enough of a power source. While we're electrifying everything, how do we build new factories and then bring mm -hmm. enough power and infrastructure to them to be part of the solution, not an increasing part of the problem? We have a diversity issue within the clean technology field. Absolutely. Um, I do like to say that clean technology, well, I don't like to say, but I do observe that. <laughs> clean technology is pale, male, and stale. And if you do the acronym, that's PMS. And nobody <laughs> wants more PMS. But to, to put the joking aside, we do know that when a founding team or a leadership team is truly diverse in two or three different dimensions, mm -hmm. we know that startup or that company is more successful. We know they have a bigger market share. We know they innovate faster. We know they produce more creative results. Mm -hmm. They do it in less time and with 50% fewer meetings. Oh, love that. Because, <laughs> I don't know, For I'm sure you're very familiar with all the emails that you're sending in the meetings you're attending. Any amount less of meetings is very a welcome. Gift. Yeah, yeah, that's a gift. <laughs> and kind of what you were describing, it seems it's all just a super intricate web. Like everything has to grow together. And in order for us to do that, it feels like they're 
needs to be collaboration across the board. Can you discuss any sort of key partnerships that your organization has formed or is looking to form to advance those sustainability initiatives? Absolutely. I was fortunate enough to step into the role in early 2020 to an organization that already had great partnerships and that already understood it was more effective when it worked with others. We like to work in partnership. We prefer to work in partnership. But partnerships are also messy and hard and challenging and take more meetings. <laughs> but it's... It's thinking about the breadth of the kinds of partners to collaborate with to truly get a new clean technology or sustainability initiative or policy change done. You need corporations, you need universities, you need research labs, you need funders, you need attorneys, you need accountants, you need human resources consultants, you need other nonprofits to come together into a web of support on workforce with rolling out services for candidates or on policy to make sure the environmental orgs and the companies are building a shared understanding to speed up that policy adoption. You need education for community, you need education for elected officials. And so we'll work with companies and organizations that do all of those things. Mm -hmm. One of our longest standing partnerships is with a, a company and organization called Virtue Lab, uh, and they are based out of Portland, and they do a lot of work to help impact clean tech adoption and support entrepreneurs and support diversity into the space. And they're a very exciting team to partner with because they're so mission focused, uh, even more so than the Clean Tech Alliance in a way because of they function slightly more as a traditional nonprofit, whereas mm -hmm. we are a traditional trade association. And they're they're just a different angle into the same problem space. Mm -hmm. And that can really strengthen partnerships. We'll do events and educational events with other nonprofits in a similar space to broaden the geographic network that's happening. And we love to partner with universities, researchers, and funders just to keep bringing resources in for entrepreneurs and companies. Absolutely. And you had mentioned policy a little bit ago as well. And how does your organization specifically engage with policymakers to promote those sustainable practices and clean tech adoption? Are there any specific policy changes that you believe would ben like significantly benefit this industry? It's very interesting to talk about clean tech policy while we're in Washington state, yeah. which is the state with the strongest suite of climate legislation of any state in the nation. Mm -hmm. So is there work to be done? Sure. Are we ahead? Yes. <laughs> is it enough? No, we have to move faster now. That's the big impetus is we have to get this done faster. But Washington State really has built a strong suite of climate legislation to include the Cap and Invest uh, Act of last year, which mm -hmm. will be facing some challenges in the legislature in the session in 2024. And so I'd encourage listeners to truly take a deep dive and work to understand that act and the possibility for transformation that it can represent. Mm -hmm. We know that it takes legislation to be the stick to begin to force some change mm -hmm. but there will be winners because of that change and the cap and invest and the carbon accounting policies that i believe will begin to see rolling out across the nation and the planet will create a lot of winners and will 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 do so in such a way that it'll bring some strong community benefits. So rather than looking at some of the immediate short-term issues, we need to look at the longer-term issues of it. Right. You know, we have a new siting bill that's helping speed up uh, policy adoption. The thing to think about now that clean energy is the law of the land and we have to do it, well, we have to do it. Right. Which means we're going to do it, which may put us ahead of many other places in the country, mm -hmm. which creates economic opportunity. Now we have things to support. We are building or have built new factories in Washington state to do next generation battery materials that will have 20 percent more energy density for car batteries. We are building uh, uh, locations that will be creating sustainable aviation fuel to really begin to deeply decarbonize and make the next steps in aviation decarbonization. We are building the largest hydrogen fuel cells in the world in Seattle, manufacturing jobs in the south part of Seattle, that's going to change a community. Absolutely. So you start to think about, well, now that we have to do it, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. But that turns into jobs and that turns into economic development for a community. And so we can't just look at one piece of legislation and say, well, it caused this one bad thing. Right. It will cause difficulties. It will cause change. But can we look one, two, five years out and see mm -hmm. what it's also going to bring? There's more policy change that is needed. We need to make pathways for new clean energies to be recognized under state statutes so that they can be incentivized. We need to continue to help siting uh, and siting regulation, uh, make sure it includes community input. 
Yes. And drives for faster outcome. Mm -hmm. We need to find ways to streamline project siting, even things as simple as EV charging mm -hmm. uh, stations, which county to county and city to city, uh, utilities or groups trying to build those will help jump through entirely different hoops and entirely different timelines. And that ends up hurting consumers because people in some counties have less choice. Yes. So there's a lot of policy work to be done. I'm going to keep making my answer to this question long <laughs> and say the way in which the Clean Tech Alliance likes to work on policy the most mm -hmm. is through education, outreach, and conversation. If we can educate an elected official about a new emerging technology so they more deeply understand it, even mm -hmm. before we're talking about policy, we're just going to get to a better endpoint faster. So we really right. like to be a resource and get engaged in education and make connections for those working on those policies. And kind of building off of that, are there any uh, success stories that you can share that Clean Tech Alliance has seen in the recent history? Anything that you're kind of like, this is a bragging right for me. There's so many to choose from. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, we're happy to see the um, the passage of the Climate Commitment Act, although mm -hmm. we weren't one of the leading public voices for it. We're very, very happy to see continued funding for the Clean Energy Fund. That's mm -hmm. been long one of our, our strongest policy uh, priorities. And the Clean Energy Fund does some early stage uh, capital for clean tech startups to be able to build new things in new ways. Frequently, those startups will bring a 10 times return with federal dollars coming in to match that state investment. So we're really, really proud of Governor Inslee's Clean Energy Fund program and understand that it's directly funded some really exciting projects. And we will be one of the loudest champions advocating for that to be continued, for that fund to be grown, to streamline applications, uh, to help pro provide support so more startups can more easily apply for those funds. Mm -hmm. So there's little tweaks that can be done, uh, but we're constantly talking about the Clean Energy Energy fund. I feel like that's the big thing is that there need to be loud voices talking about it all the time in order for change to happen. And like what you've said earlier about not necessarily looking at the short term impact, but the long term impact, what are some emerging trends that you are starting to see in the clean tech sector? And how would do you envision the industry evolving within the next 10, five to 10 years? I think within the next five to 10 years, we're really going to see uh, the, the curve shoot up on pace of adoption. That's um, exciting. <laughs> we've seen the cost for solar panels come down and come down dramatically in the last 15-ish uh, years mm -hmm. to the point that more and more Washingtonians, as we're recording this on a very dark, very rainy day, are considering adding solar. But Alaska, far northern Alaskan communities are getting ready to install solar because if those solar panels produce only two months a year, Mm -hmm. It now makes financial sense and it pencils. It yes. makes sense for them to put that in. It will save them on overall energy costs. Mm -hmm. And so that next five to 10 years into new clean technologies starts to make things more broadly accessible, more broadly available. If we solve all those other challenges we talked about earlier with workforce development mm -hmm. and supply chain and siting, but we're going to see, I very much hope and very much believe we're going to see new kinds of clean energy generation. We're going to see new forms of energy. Uh, we'll see hydrogen becoming commercially used and coming out of the lab and out of out of that experimental or that that studying phase for some scale of vehicles, whether that's large scale construction equipment or it's uh, consumer vehicles. I think we're going to see more choice. We're certainly seeing a lot more electronic vehicles coming on the market. We're seeing right. more kinds of charging infrastructure. We're going to see the next generation batteries get a much longer easily within 10 to 15 years. We should have thousand mile batteries uh, that's so that cool. charge in. 10, 15 minutes uh, at the superchargers. So we're going to see, you know, energy refueling stations change. We're going to see some variety. We may see a little bit of that VHS versus beta. Is it going to be electric? Uh -oh. Is it going to be hydrogen? Is it yeah. going to be both for a while? But the real answer is communities have choice. Right. Some things will work better in some areas than others. Very remote, remote areas and EV charging infrastructure, that's still a little bit of a tough nut to crack. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think if if anything, choice is incredibly important to the consumer and a really great tool for adoption for the everyday consumer, um, which actually kind of leads me to my next question, which is what do you perceive as the main barriers preventing wider adoption of clean tech or sustainability initiatives? And how do you think that we can overcome those barriers? So I like to think with a really bird's eye view approach, it's not about educating one consumer or one company or one city to make one next best choice. Mm -hmm. 
that alone isn't going to get this done. It's about creating a system within which that sustainable choice is the default. So people do it because it's just easier for them. Mm -hmm. People are busy. Yeah. You know, a, 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 a single dad with three kids isn't going to work that much harder to sort the recycling, isn't going to make refueling the vehicle take three times as long. These things are barriers to real humans' lives. And right. the reason we're trying to tackle and mitigate climate change is to help real life people. So we have to do it in a way that makes it easy for real life people to participate. So mm -hmm. some things are cost, but you see that with any new technology and you see the cost come down. Do you remember what plasma TVs cost when they were brand new? Oh my gosh, right. of the size? You yeah. Know? And now you're like, wait, that was only $400. So we're going to see those costs change. And we're beginning to. We're seeing com competition in the EV market is going to tweak pricing. We're seeing solar costs coming down. But at a broader level, the systems have to change so that, well, of course I recycled because it was easier and better for me. Right. Whether you're talking to a company, whether you're talking to an individual, of course I was choosing between an EV or a hydrogen or a plug-in hybrid because right. that was easier and better for me. Yeah. And so it takes government capital and it takes policy to create those conditions. And then it takes economic reward on the other side for participating in that new clean energy job, which pays 25% more than the average job in America. And so you right. have to have the carrots out there to draw us to it but it does take some policy it does take mm -hmm. some sticks and it does take some early adopters proof of concept has to happen as well and i think we've seen that with evs we're getting over that hump absolutely in the areas that have built out the charging infrastructure yes. right and so for if you do not live in an area where that's simple you cannot adopt it yeah i remember uh, a couple of my friends and i we went out to montana for a skiing trip and one of our friends drives an ev and we were like i hope you're gonna make it <laughs> because you're going through large patches of where you're not going to have any charging stations um but they made it so that's good and exciting to hear but uh my partner and i uh we also love to just point out all of the electric vehicles we're like "Ooh, there's a rivian "Ooh, there's a tesla and then we've been seeing a lot of other traditional car companies also introducing new um, new EVs, which is also really exciting. And it's just such a far cry from what it was even five, 10 years ago when like the Prius was the most sustainable car that you could get. Right. And now there's so many different options. And I don't know, that's just like, it's cool to be able to see that change, but you're right. It did take a minute for it to change, right. which is a little concerning, but I don't know. I've personally always thought of clean energy and just sustainability initiatives in general as like stocks for those who want to take it from more a more business perspective where you have to invest and you're going to see a really great payout in the future but you have to be patient but we are getting to that point like you said where patience isn't necessarily something that we need to have we need to have action um the beauty of clean technology mm -hmm. is that there are a lot of different groups that want to take action right if you're focusing on a new clean technology project um, you're really talking to politicians, I like to say, all the way around the rotunda. We're not talking to each side of the aisle, because if you're talking to 100 politicians, you have 100 points of view. Mm -hmm. But there is something about a new clean energy project, energy security, national defense, uh, good good jobs for the community, right. uh, save the birds, cleaner <laughs> energy, reduce greenhouse gases. Clean technology connects to a lot of different people who have a lot of different visions about the best way to provide for their communities. Mm -hmm. And so we really love to think about those myriad of benefits when we're talking about projects and, and help that speed adoption. There's something there for everyone. Right. Um, so it's, it's very exciting to, to be on that cusp of seeing those transitions speed up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that you just see one political persuasion choosing to drive an electric vehicle. You know, right. that, that choice is there. They have other features. They're fast. They're fun. They're cool looking. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. But we also have to, while we understand that clean technology projects have benefits for a myriad of political uh, platforms and outlooks, we also need to think about ways to use economics to speed that pace of adoption. Mm -hmm. And my personal concern has long been that trickle down clean technology. Mm -hmm won't finish getting it done. Mm. If the EVs are 30 to 50% more expensive than other vehicles, there's a large portion of America that will never be able to purchase one. Absolutely. So we have to understand how to build the programs and the support and the policy and the financial incentives. So, and this is a Biden administration phrase, so that clean technology can come from the bottom up mm -hmm. and the middle out. And that's jobs in that sector and it's policies to help, again, build the system. So adopting the sustainable option is the de facto. Right. 
And speaking of bottom up, middle out, how does either the Clean Tech Alliance or from your perspective, um, organizations address the social aspects of sustainability when it comes to there are a lot of different people with a lot of different means, a lot of different backgrounds. How are you able to address those social aspects of sustainability equitably? It's a really important question, mm -hmm. and it, it maybe should be the question that we started with, you know, <laughs> yeah. and based everything else on. Um, one of those policies that I refer to here in Washington State is called the HEAL Act, mm -hmm. uh, and our Climate Commitment Act funds and investment from them will be required to be 30 to 40 percent invested in communities that have always been furthest from the resources. In this case, it's going to focus, focus on environmental and air pollution and use that for investment decisions. Mm -hmm. So the most polluted communities will have priority to have those pollution factors cleaned up or replaced. Right. So if we can go into denser, lower income, inner city areas that have long been told, oh, we're putting this factory here. It'll be great. You'll love it. Right. And then it's not great. Maybe they didn't love it. And clean those sites up first. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to begin that investment. And now we've proven that new plant X or new boiler or new energy system Y really did make things cleaner. Here's mm -hmm. our demonstration site. Here's our project. It cleaned up a community. And now we can spread out that adoption of that kind of technology. Right. Um, the federal government for a lot of the um, investments that they're making and grants that they're making right now because of the IRA is also aligned with the Justice 40 Act, which is very similar, that mm -hmm. we have to go into uh, energy burden communities and communities where a coal plant shut down or a natural gas community is losing jobs as that factory is reducing production, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to go into those areas and do economic development investment there first. Mm -hmm. If we're going to build batteries, if we're going to build electric vehicles, if we're going to build solar panels, if we're going to build wind turbines, let's build them somewhere where people need jobs because the other right. energy jobs were turned off. So that's an example of those two policies, both at the state and federal level, seeking to do that. When we're doing advocacy and educational events, the way we at the Clean Tech Alliance like to complement that is by saying, well, if you're going to spend what's currently limited resources training EV technicians or um, giving an incentive to switch to electric vehicles, why don't we start with fleets mm -hmm. instead of individuals? Because that bus fleet, well, it doesn't park in Medina overnight, does it? And so diesel bus fleets or even commercial fleets are coming back to cheaper land to park on overnight. Mm -hmm. And so those are next to folks that are, those maps when you pull them up are, yep. are heavily aligned with the most air pollution with the lowest income community. So if we can focus public resources, tran transition fleets first, we're affecting a greater number of people more quickly. Right. That's awesome. And a really concise answer. I feel like it's always really hard to conceptualize and wrap your mind around those topics, especially if you aren't necessarily part of the community because you don't have the same insights. So it's exciting. And I feel like that also is a great um, example why having a diverse group of people making decisions at the head of the table is so important because there are so many different perspectives, so many different lifestyles, backgrounds that are necessary in order to make sure that we are not leaving anybody behind when it comes to a sustainable future. Hey, I feel like, Emily, rare, rarely does anyone tell me that I'm succinct. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> uh, and we do see a lot of the uh, member companies that we work with in the state and in the region. Uh, a lot of our large corporations really do deeply understand and are committed to that diversity um, mm -hmm. at all levels of their leadership. So we see that in a lot of our larger utilities. We see that in uh, city government, uh, environmental and sustainability and economic departments that are working on these challenge spaces. Uh, we see that in hiring practices and internships at HVAC contractors that are working to, you know, re- um, Oh, I lost the word. Rehabilitate, reform, remodel, revise. Yes. There's a word in there somewhere. We <laughs> see that at our some of our large HVAC contractors that are mm -hmm. retrofitting buildings. Uh, we right. see a commitment to diversifying the intern pools that they bring in. We see cities uh, and, and utilities in more rural areas working hard to do internship and apprenticeship programs down into eighth and ninth grade and, and get 11th graders out for the summer out on the job site, understanding what it's like to work for a utility and mm -hmm. giving them some on the job experience before they finish choosing their career right. a, as an innovative way to make sure they're diversifying their workforce rather than wringing their hands and saying, gosh, we sure wish we had diverse applicants. Yep. We're seeing companies very proactively find ways to connect with broader communities to improve their recruiting. That's awesome. I love to hear it. 
You had mentioned earlier about the educational events that Clean Tech Alliance does. Besides, of course, coming on podcasts or like how we met when you were speaking on a panel at UW, how does the Clean Tech Alliance dedicate itself to educating the broader community, whether that be policymakers, whether that be students, whether it be other organizations? What do you all do? Generally, in our history, we've really focused on education between and for the business community Mm -hmm. and to elected officials. So outreach into student groups and into community organizations is a newer initiative for us. And we're working on uh, new partnerships with media companies or other kinds of nonprofits Mm -hmm. that are more engaged in direct to the individual the kind of nonprofit I used to be in. And so we're working on forming those partnerships, which will help us bridge that messaging rather than build whole new programs in an area that are outside our core competency. Mm -hmm. We'd like to go partner with those that are already there. And so we'll have some new, exciting, uh, green activities happening in Seattle this summer uh, that I should come back on the podcast and talk about. You absolutely should. Booking it now. (laughs) And that's going to be very, very much focused on families, and community members rather than businesses. So we're going to do that in partnership. Um, Definitely, we'll make that faster. Uh, We're also working on adding programming internally that's a little bit more aligned to workforce or talent and training and recruiting. And how can we connect successful, diverse uh, executives and engineers and scientists at our companies out into communities to inspire more people to pursue these careers? And so that's one that I think is a program we'll keep in-house. That's awesome. Kind of building off of that uh, with educating more students, younger individuals, what for aspiring individuals to become leaders in the clean tech and sustainability field, what advice would you give them based off of your own experiences? Go get an engineering degree. Shoot. (laughs) Uh, If that's not in the cards for you, as it was not for me, Mm -hmm. again, assess your skill set and what do you do? Mm -hmm. Identify 10 companies that you think, wow, if I worked for them, I'd really be crushing it in sustainability. Start stalking their job boards and understand what they're hiring for. Understand what conferences they go to, they present Mm -hmm. at, and they sponsor and go start networking at those conferences and get to know people. But figure out what do I do? What am I an expert in? What training do I have? And Mm -hmm. if you can't get more training, then you do that assessment. What do I know? What do I have? I took a business career that was in human resources and finance and then a nonprofit career that was in program delivery and said, ah, now I have all the elements to run a nonprofit because I can do the human resources, I can run the books, and I can build programs for individuals. Uh, And it was taking three very feckless job hops and disparate (laughs) things and amassing them into a skill set. And there are a variety of ways to do that. But understand where you want to go. You may not know the company that you want to go work at, but you might know the kind of work you want to do. I want to be designing programs for A, B, and C that cause D, E, and F. Right. So then you have some research to do to find out who is doing that. And if you find out that nobody is doing that, congratulations, you're an entrepreneur. There you go. And I feel like um, for my own personal research into the green job market as someone who's not an engineer, it is quite shocking, honestly, how basically every single company needs someone in sustainability, even ones that you wouldn't expect. Like I saw a dating app that was hiring for an ESG manager. Would never have expected that they would have needed somebody in sustainability to join their workforce but here we are and I feel like that just goes to show that it is thankfully becoming a more widespread adoption that an expectation that companies have someone that is dedicated to sustainability and furthering their sustainability policies and practices within that company that will hopefully carry on to again a more sustainable future and I think we'll see that happen where we have strong climate policy Mm -hmm. because now it's in that company's best interest to be more sustainable because it saves them money on their bottom line. Exactly. As the cost of carbon goes up, as companies that are looking forward towards the impacts of climate change, understanding how that will disrupt their customers, their Mm -hmm. employees, their factories, their uh, brick and mortar sites, their shipping times, their supply chains, all these things will be affected by climate events. And so it's in a company's best financial long-term interest to be sustainable. And as we see that realization dawning, again, it's building the system in which that's the default choice. And it's it's pervasive. It's everywhere. I've talked to cloud computing executives that say, well, we redesigned the way we store this customer data so that it takes a third of the time per transaction. Well, that's fascinating. Why did you do that? Well, it takes a third of the time per transaction. 
It takes a third of the time per transaction, but it also is going to save us a lot of money. That's a lot less server costs. That's a lot less waste heat. That's a lot less energy. So when a cloud computing company knows when we make our software more efficient, we're also becoming more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. These things add up. And so, yes, sustainability will end up being everywhere. Every company will be a sustainability company and every employee will care about sustainability. Whether they use the word or not, it's going to continue to be the way we do business. Mm -hmm. Which I think is different and nice. Personally, I feel like sustainability was kind of a fringe aspect that people like thought about in passing and now it's becoming part of the mainstream, which again is really exciting and I'm glad to finally see that starting to ramp up. And really that was the all of my questions for you. So I would love to just give you a couple seconds, like whatever you want to talk about, plug for Clean Tech Alliance, any side projects that you're doing, whatever you're feeling like floor is yours. I don't know if I was ready for the shameless plug. <laughs> We're always interested in connecting with student teams, with student learners. We're always interested in connecting in the community, always interested in hearing about a startup that succeeded in the climate space that we haven't known about yet. We will be um, building new resources to connect to student groups, young professionals, networks, emerging professionals looking for career transitions. Uh, we are just at the beginning of doing some of that work so that we can amalgamate those resources uh, of our members for folks that are job seekers. Uh, and so again, we're trying to fill that that middleware space a little bit and, and create a few more resources and make those job searches a little easier for both sides of the equation. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, another couple years of growth. We're looking forward to some exciting summer green activities in the city. Uh, it's great to continue to partner with and work with the city of Seattle and see the green initiatives and the mayor's green transportation initiatives. We know there's changes coming because of that. Um, there are new factories and new kinds of clean energy generation coming to the state that will create job opportunity uh, and hopefully in, in even greater economic uh, growth than I'm picturing. <laughs> I think it's a pretty exciting time and it's going to have to be because as the planet warms, as the storms get stronger, as it's raining how heavily today and potentially flooding so in my neighborhood at home today, yep. you know, we know we have to get this done and it's going to take everybody, but it has to take everybody in a way that's achievable. Mm -hmm. and it has to be something that every American can participate in. If we write, rewrite, if we rewrite and redesign the global economic structure and how we deliver energy, we don't create the opportunity for all people to create generational wealth, then we've still failed. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much again for coming on. Really appreciate all your time. I know you're busy. You got lots of emails and meetings to get back to. So thank you again. Um, and hopefully I'll see you again next summer. Yeah, and we can think, learn more about the Green Jobs Initiative. I think in April or May, we'll we'll have some, some fun green things that'll be happening in the city to talk about. I'll talk to Jessica. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. And that concludes this week's episode. Again, a huge thank you to Mel for taking the time to chat. I really loved her conversation and I hope you all did as well. Links to the Clean Tech Alliance site are in the episode description and I super highly recommend checking them out, maybe even getting involved. If you have any questions, thoughts, or requests for future episodes, Reach out via urbantumbleweedpod at gmail.com or at urbantumbleweedpodcast on Instagram. Those are also linked in the description. And there will also be a poll on the Spotify episode and on Instagram for what all of you listeners would like to be called. I sourced a couple of fun names via Instagram last month, uh, also via a poll from all of you. So if you want to stay up to date and engage with the community, participate in polls like I just mentioned, give the podcast a follow on Instagram and TikTok. But until then, stay red. See you soon. Bye.